Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So I want to thank you all for coming out. It's uh, not quite the same energy we had last year. So it's either because we're not giving away $80 million or people know my public speaking skills by now. Um, so I want to welcome you to the uh, state of the school. And we will begin, as we always do, by uh, acknowledging uh, our former faculty who have um, passed away during the last uh, academic year. Uh, as well as those colleagues who have um, uh, retired uh, over the last uh, academic year. Um, and I wanted to start by uh, acknowledging uh, two people who um, uh, have uh, made important contributions to the school um, and are moving on to uh, the next phases of their careers. Uh, one is Maureen Garrity our uh, Dean for Student Life, who has been uh, serving in one capacity or another at the school for uh, 34 years, uh, starting as a clinical researcher, served as Dean of Admissions for a while, and most recently been our Dean of Student Life. Uh, Maureen is retiring um, at the end of this calendar month, um, and a search is underway for her uh, replacement. Uh, and the second is uh, a chair, Bob Friedman, our chair of psychiatry, who uh, stepped down as chair and retired um, uh, last year after a distinguished career um, with a research focus in schizophrenia, which has uh, been uh, acknowledged both in terms of extramural funding and uh, national scientific recognition. Uh, Bob has been kind enough to step back in and uh, lead the research endeavor um, in the absence of Randy Ross, who uh, passed away, unfortunately, recently, um, until we find uh, the next uh, chair. So the structure of today's talk is um, I'm going to do the uh, usual uh, data dump that everybody gets um, and uh, try to be um, uh, relatively concise about it but hit the high points. For those of you who suffer from insomnia or have an insatiable desire for data, there are facts and figure books in those uh, uh, boxes up front um, for you to access. Uh, I'm going to briefly cover um, the status of our relationships with our principal affiliates because uh, we are integrally uh, uh, intertwined with them in terms of our trajectory and our uh, overall um, uh, health. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about um, my thoughts after being here for 20 months about one of the factors that distinguishes this institution from many across uh, the United States, and that is the culture of our faculty. Um, then we'll talk about um, uh, the growing recognition of what's going on in this campus, uh, a strategic plan, including a brief update on the initiatives whose funding we announced at this time last year, um, and then uh, talk about the future. Um, which is probably the most interesting part of this talk because it is a total data-free zone. Um, unless you follow the Twitterverse and then you're uh, up to speed. Um, so um, we continue to grow. Um, so we have about 250 more faculty on this campus than we did at this time last year. And our affiliates have added uh, 50 additional faculty on top of that. So overall, we are uh, 300 plus uh, more faculty than um, we were uh, when I gave this uh, talk last year. We're now in our third year of our expanded medical school class. We went from 160 to 184 students a year um, and launched our branch campus in Colorado Springs. So at this time next year, we'll have roughly 730, 740 medical students at our new um, uh, steady state. Um, this is your dean's favorite graph um, uh, and um, reflects um, a couple of things um, that uh, you probably all know instinctively based on um, how hard you're working, but um, we continue to grow. Um, what does not continue to grow is that little red line at the bottom. So those are your tax dollars at work. That's our state appropriation, um, which... Um, is pretty flat for the last 30 years, which means in inflation uh, adjusted dollars, it's sort of like the NIH budget, it's uh, actually declined um, substantially. Um, 
And you can see that uh, two areas of uh, significant growth are our grants portfolio and our uh, clinical practice uh, income. Um, this uh, marked a watershed year where we renamed um, the uh, practice from uh, University Physicians Incorporated, of which there are apparently at least a half a dozen across the United States, uh, to um, uh, University of Colorado Medicine. And this is what that uh, practice plan looks like. Um, uh, you can see now we are, in terms of our clinical practice, roughly a $700 million a year enterprise, uh, growing at about 10% per year um, for the last half dozen years or so. Um, that's about $500 million in direct uh, collections from the clinical services you and your colleagues perform. Um, and another $200 million or so in uh, contract revenue. Uh, so far this year, halfway through the fiscal year, we're up about another 10% uh, over the pace we were at um, last year. Um, and as we'll uh, go through in the next couple slides, uh, this is an important economic engine for everything that goes on uh, on this campus. Our trend in extramural funding um, also uh, increases, uh, has increased substantially. We're up to about the 370 or so, $371 million of total extramural funding in the School of Medicine. Uh, that's up about 10% uh, from where we were two years ago. Um, so 331 two years ago, 346 last year, 371 um, this year. Our NIH grants are actually down a couple percent, um, but as you can see, our non-federal funding is up uh, substantially. So we've diversified our portfolio, um, but the future of the NIH, as we'll talk about, and particularly the indirect costs associated with NIH grants, uh, are an important component in planning for uh, our future on this campus. Uh, this is what everybody wants um, and none of us have, which is the return of the indirects to this campus. Um, so um, most of the indirects um, generated by our activity goes to pay um, the mortgages on these buildings that we're sitting in now. Um, and that will be the case for about the next decade. Around 2026, 2027, those bonds are retired. Um, and um, that uh, yearly interest payment, those yearly interest payments will go away. I have no doubt we will uh, be able to supplant them with new interest payments uh, in the interim. Um, so we get about 10% of our indirects back, and of that 10%, uh, we keep 10% centrally to fund uh, grants and contracts and other administrative functions, and the uh, other 9% of that 10% is passed through to the departments that generated um, those grants. And here's how we spend our money, or at least one of the ways we spend our money, and that's um, uh, paying faculty. Um, if you look at our faculty payroll, the predominant source of um, our funding is the practice plan, almost three quarters of it. Um, uh, about 12% overall is grants, and in the basic science departments, it's about 46%, um, as you see. Um, our state appropriation is distributed, as you see there, and is the fourth um, largest source of our, um, our revenue. Um, so as we all know, uh, but it's good to um, uh, emphasize this point at this point of the talk, um, education and research are noble missions uh, to which we are totally committed. They are really bad businesses. Um, and um, uh, the estimates vary between 25% uh, to 53%, according to the AMC, of the additional monies you have to put in on top of your grant funding to um, make the research operation a whole. Um, and as you saw from the uh, uh, slide I showed earlier, um, that 53%, 30%, whatever you consider the number to be, is not coming from the state. So. Uh, it is every researcher's dream and every educator's dream to have hard money. Um, we don't have any hard money. So as Lily Marks has been saying for years, we are a soft money uh, enterprise, and therefore the fates of all of our missions are really inextricably linked um, to what happens in our practice plan. So other signs of growth, we have a number of new divisions that have been approved um, 
since uh, we last uh, had this talk last year, there's a division of hospital medicine in the Department of Medicine reflecting the emergence of that specialty um, and the importance of that group of practitioners to the way we deliver care now. Uh, two new divisions were just approved in the Department of Surgery, uh, vascular and endovascular surgery and uh, surgical oncology, uh, all reflective of the growth going on in this campus. And we have our first cohort of students down in Colorado Springs. Um, we have a longitudinally integrated medical curriculum down there for the third year. So we're about, probably about 70% of the way through it now. Um, people started there uh, late last spring. Um, we've uh, tried to assess the performance of that curriculum in a number of ways. Um, there is, of course, the most popular way, which is anecdote. Um, and um, uh, so far, uh, the anecdotes, by and large, are positive, with one or two uh, notable exceptions, which are highly entertaining and not worthy of repeating here. Um, we look at uh, test scores, such as shelf exams. And um, on average, the students in Colorado Springs are actually scoring slightly higher than um, our students in the traditional block curriculum here. And we've had a number of focus groups down there with students and faculty to get uh, feedback um, in sort of a uh, qualitative, semi-quantitative, structured interview type of way. And um, those reviews are generally good. Um, it's, uh, you know, been logistically um, uh, challenging to schedule all these people to be in all these different places. So there have been one or two little hiccups. But uh, um, the leadership down there has done a great job of uh, getting this off the ground. And our students are... Um, been uh, warmly welcomed by the medical community um, down there. Um, so overall, a, a very positive experience. So I want to talk a little bit about where things are with our um, affiliates. Um, and I'm going to focus on sort of the big five, uh, starting with the big two out of the big five, which is the University of Colorado Health System and uh, Children's Hospital of Colorado. Um, so this year, we took the strategic move with the approval of the board of um, then UPI, now um, uh, CU Medicine, uh, to join in an equity position in the clinically integrated network that's being put together by the University of Colorado uh, Health System. Um, and f as part of that uh, effort, filed our intention to participate in the MSSP Track 3 um, value-based reimbursement for Medicare. Um, uh, we uh, continue to get substantial support from the academic support agreement that went into effect uh, three years ago. Um, that was originally a five-year agreement. Um, and um, as part of the next point that I'll get to um, was changed to an uh, auto-renewing uh, evergreen agreement as part of our uh, new affiliation agreement. Um, and that has made an important difference in the discretionary money we have available to uh, invest in education and research. Uh, this year, uh, for the year that finished uh, June 30th, it was uh, roughly $23, um, uh, $23 million. Um, uh, we, um, uh, about uh, eight or nine months ago, um, uh, renegotiated our affiliation agreement with the University of Colorado Hospital Authority and the University of Colorado Health System uh, to update it to reflect the fact that uh, UCHS is now a system and not a single hospital on this campus. Um, and that agreement was written at a time when um, the world of the University of Colorado Health System was the Anschutz Medical Campus. Um, uh, so we have a new agreement, I think, that better reflects our current environment, um, the fact that they are a system, um, uh, and acknowledges the importance of our uh, partnership and mutual dependence on each other. Um, you can't drive too far around the greater Denver area and not stumble across a new University of Colorado uh, health facility. Um, and uh, we will be uh, partnering with them with the new hospital in Highlands Ranch. We are working with them at the opened hospital in Broomfield. Uh, there's a uh, new facility at, um, in uh, Cherry Creek um, that's opening up shortly, um, all of which we are uh, participating in. And last, we continue to have representation from the leadership of the university and the school on the board of both the hospital and the uh, health system. 
Uh, Children's Hospital Colorado is also forming a clinically integrated network, and we will uh, be participating in that um, as an important source of specialty, excuse me, specialty care for that uh, network. Um, uh, under the leadership of Jenna Hausman and her team, uh, we had a leadership retreat in August and left there with a renewed commitment to try to um, uh, remove some of the administrative barriers that have existed between children's and the school in terms of uh, research administration, clinical trials, uh, credentialing, um, et cetera. And we are um, making um, slow but steady progress in, uh, on, on those issues. Um, when Children's Hospital surrendered its license in Colorado Springs, uh, the school took over the management of the Briargate Clinic, um, which is now um, a, a freestanding clinic. And in light of the new CMS regulations re uh, regarding hospital-based clinics, is likely um, to remain a, a freestanding clinic uh, going forward. Um, and as you all know, uh, Children's broke ground um, on a, a new hospital in uh, Colorado Springs, which is anticipated to open uh, about two years from now. And we will have an important role in that hospital, as well as uh, uh, the expansion of their facility in Broomfield. Uh, and as well, we uh, have representation on the board of um, uh, Children's Hospital. Uh, Denver Health. At uh, this time last year, um, uh, with no, uh, no insult intended towards anyone at Denver Health, uh, things were in a bit of turmoil uh, there. Um, anytime your health system is on the front page of the Denver Post, it's probably not a good thing. Um, and I would say 12 months later, things are a lot better. Um, we continue, as we did um, back then, to have regular leadership meetings and talk about uh, joint initiatives with uh, Denver Health. Uh, they have substantially uh, changed the ranks of their leadership over the past year. So uh, Bill Berman, who ran uh, Denver Public Health, is now the acting CEO, and uh, active search is underway um, for, uh, to name a permanent CEO in that position. Uh, Connie Price is now their chief medical officer. Abraham Nussbaum took over as the director of education. Uh, Romania Hasnain Winia, um, who, uh, as you might guess from the name behind the hyphen there, is uh, married to Matt Winnie of our bioethics program, uh, joined us from PCORI to lead research uh, um, at uh, Denver Health. Uh, Ed Havernack, well-known to most people here, took over as the chief of service for medicine. And Mitchell Cohen was recruited from uh, University of California, San Francisco, uh, his expertise is in trauma, uh, to lead the uh, surgical service there. Um, they are looking for new leadership in emergency medicine and anesthesiology, as well as the CEO search I mentioned. And uh, we are represented on that board by uh, Doug Jones, our former senior associate dean for uh, clinical affairs. Um, uh, the VA, um, you'd be happy to know, is now 84% complete. And it is my fervent wish that I can stand up here next year and say it's 102% complete. Um, uh, they have a new director of the center, Sally Hazard uh, uh, Hanfelder, who uh, I have to say um, uh, has been great to work with. She's been uh, a, a good partner um, and uh, better her than me in dealing with what she's uh, dealing uh, with there. They anticipate starting to move some uh, ambulatory clinical programs into that facility and opening up to patients um, in the fall uh, of 2017. Uh, completion of construction around this time in 2018 um, and probably fully operational uh, for all their services uh, by late spring of uh, 2018. Uh, part of that facility will be a new spinal cord injury center um, for which they're uh, actively recruiting um, a director. Um, and uh, last but not least, uh, National Jewish Health. Um, so uh, we continue to have a joint department there, uh, immunology and microbiology, uh, chaired by uh, John Cambier. Um, uh, we continue to have important ongoing research collaborations. Um, we, I think, were good partners in recruiting their new chief of pediatrics, Pam Zeitlin, who came here from uh, Johns Hopkins, a pediatric pulmonologist who, uh, whose particular interest is in cystic fibrosis. Uh, 
Um, and for the first time in a long time, we actually have representation on the National Jewish uh, Board as well. Um, uh, we continue to cooperate in some clinical programs and uh, compete uh, in others. So I wanted to spend a couple of minutes talking about what I think is a distinguishing feature of this place, which is the culture of the faculty. And uh, for those of us who have recently come here, um, uh, I think uh, we may appreciate that it's better than people who grew up here. Um, because if you've been at one place uh, for a long time, you know what you know, but you um, may not have a good understanding of how it contrasts with the rest of the world. But um, I think the thing that distinguishes the faculty here and the chairs of the faculty here is their uh, commitment to the common enterprise here. And I think there's some very uh, tangible examples. Everybody will tell you that they're committed to the common enterprise. You know, it's sort of a godmother and apple pie kind of thing. Um, but if you judge people by what they do or, or how they spend their money, um, uh, I think you have tangible evidence here. So uh, number one, um, the practice plan here um, has been uh, an important contributor to student scholarships um, and has made substantial increases um, in the amount that we've devoted to student scholarships. So uh, when I arrived here, it was $350,000 a year, and then we moved it to $500,000 a year, and now it's $750,000 a year uh, towards student uh, scholarships, and that includes not only medical students, but physician's assistant students and physical therapy students uh, as well. Um, uh, as uh, many of you know, um, the decision was made when the new uh, building was opened after the sale of the first UPI building to the VA to take the lease revenue from that building and put it into a fund to endow chairs um, with the priority having been set as to fund chairs for department chairs who don't have an endowed chair if that's enough chairs in one sentence. Um, and this year, um, we reached the $2 million mark and funded the first of those uh, University of Colorado medicine chairs uh, in the Department of Anesthesiology. Um, uh, under the uh, committee led by uh, Naresh Mandava, the chair of ophthalmology, um, the sort of operating rules are the next one of those chairs will go to a chair of a basic science department who does not hold an endowed chair. Um, and then go back to a clinical department after that and alternate until we have um, made sure that every department chair uh, holds an endowed chair. Um, uh, the next two items I think are fairly unique uh, to this campus. Um, one is that um, all of our departments uh, contribute to uh, funding the deficit that um, is uh, part of the reality of practicing primary care in America these days. Um, as well as uh, funding um, uh, the uh, clinical operations for non-proceduralists, uh, people um, who don't have access to procedural income um, in order to be able to pay them competitive salaries. So, you know, bluntly put, when you have surgeons and radiation oncologists and orthopedists and neurosurgeons all willing to contribute uh, their clinical income towards supporting primary care and non-proceduralists, it speaks uh, a lot to the uh, culture of the place. And um, I can't say that I have a comprehensive inventory across the United States, but um, I think this is a, a pretty uncommon um, arrangement uh, and um, speaks volumes to uh, the recognition of the importance of these things and the willingness uh, to invest in them. Uh, we continue to have a strong commitment to the underserved. So as you know, Colorado is a Medicaid expansion state. 2013, we took care of about 95,000 Medicaid patients on this campus. Uh, this past year, uh, 165,000 Medicaid patients on this campus. Uh, about 50% of the clinical volume at Children's Hospital uh, is Medicaid. If you go to UCHA uh, across the street here right now, about 30% of those beds are occupied by uh, Medicaid patients. So in a state where 20% of the population is now on Medicaid, um, we are certainly do doing not only our share, but more than our share statistically in uh, caring for this uh, population. And um, our faculty at Denver Health continue to pursue their mission of being a safety net hospital and uh, serving um, the underserved. 
Um, over the next 12 months, I think uh, we will be rolling out some new initiatives targeted at veterans uh, who have a series of health needs that have uh, not been well met by the health care system to date. Um, and I hope uh, to be able to share some exciting developments in that uh, at the talk, this talk, this time next year. And then last but not least, uh, the Academic Enrichment Fund, so uh, AKA the Dean's Tax. Um, uh, about 10% of the clinical collections that uh, go into our practice plan have since the early 1980s uh, been uh, transferred into the Academic Enrichment Fund. And that's what this trajectory um, looks like. Um, so this year, uh, we are pretty close to cumulatively have, have, having had contributed uh, half a billion dollars to the Academic Enrichment Fund, about 500 million, um, of which we have spent uh, 423 and have uh, a little over $70 million in the bank. And before all of you email me right after this talk, with your next great idea, uh, I call your attention to the important note at the bottom of this slide, uh, which we have, uh, over the next five years, going to invest as much as we have over the last 30. Um, we have um, $500 million in um, uh, commitments um, uh, to the enterprise here uh, over the next five years. Um, and you can see in this uh, pie graph of... Uh, uh, how we have spent it. It's been um, uh, to recruit chairs who have a vision for building their departments, to invest in school uh, campus-wide programs and cores, um, and um, to participate in important uh, recruits that um, for uh, which uh, resources are needed. Um, so I think... Um, when you look back at our state funding that I showed you early in here, and you look at this number of 422 million, you can see the economic engine that has built the research enterprise on this campus and that is subsidizing the educational enterprise on this campus is um, the AEF and the um, uh, clinical practice of our faculty. Uh, an important welcome addition over the past couple of years has been um, uh, the funds transfer from the University of Colorado Health System. And we continue to have a number of initiatives like uh, personalized medicine being the most recent example in which our hospital partners have co-invested with the university and the school uh, to make those programs a reality. Um, uh, I used to say that we were the best kept secret in Colorado. Um, and a lot of people drove past us when they should be driving to us. Um, I think the word is starting to get out. Uh, Children's remains a top 10 uh, hospital in the, uh, in the national rankings, and uh, we are ranked in uh, 10 pediatric subspecialties. Uh, this year, for the first time, uh, University of Colorado Hospital appeared on the U.S. News and World Report uh, Hospital Honor Roll uh, at number 20, also ranked in 10 specialties. Um, uh, you... Um, uh, pick up a copy of 5280, and our faculty are disproportionately represented in the top doctors in um, uh, this region. Uh, under Dan Theodoreski's leadership, we uh, successfully renewed, although we're waiting formal notification, our uh, comprehensive cancer support grant um, this year, which is an important milestone. Um, we continue to have one of the highest performing CTSAs and CTSIs in the U.S., and uh, have our fingers crossed for Ron to uh, competitively renew that uh, later this year. Um, and our patients have noticed. So we have a bunch of new endowed chairs this year, which uh, one of which was funded by our practice plan. Um, but the remainder have largely been uh, funded by grateful patients. Um, and as you can see here, um, uh, these are... Um, all important sources of support uh, for our faculty that recognize the excellence of both our clinical and our research um, uh, programs. Uh, for instance, in uh, uh, women's health research, there are a total of 20 endowed chairs in women's health research across the entire United States, and two of them uh, are uh, on this campus. Um, so uh, I think uh, the word is starting to get out, um, and um, we hope to continue uh, in that trend. Uh, thanks to Scott Arthur, Jim Hodges, uh, 
Karen Arstead, who helps us with our uh, student scholarships. Uh, the CU Foundation has uh, been great partners with us and our faculty in bringing more philanthropic dollars to the campus. And you can see uh, the trend uh, over the last several years um, uh, mirrors the uh, trend in both uh, research growth and in uh, clinical growth as well. So last year they exceeded the $100 million mark and now Scott and his team are living with the curse of you've done it once, you have to do it again, um, uh, and which the chancellor reminds them of on a daily basis. Um, so uh, I want to talk a little bit about um, uh, our strategy in the short and medium term here. Uh, in the very short term, as in like two months, uh, I want to get reaccredited as a medical school. That would be a good thing to be an officially accredited medical school. Um, I'm going to give you a brief update on what's happened with the transformational research initiatives since this time last year. I'm going to mention, and I will give the caveat and disclaimer right now, um, some of the talent we've recruited uh, with 300 new faculty over the past year, it is impossible to mention everybody. So I'm going to mention a few, and for those who don't get mentioned, um, my apologies. Um, uh, we need to um, uh, now cope with the fact that is a, a relatively new phenomena is um, uh, we have a lot of people who want to come get their care here. And we are at the point where we are stretched to the limit um, and how many people we can accommodate um, on this campus. Um, so uh, how we're going to deal with that, um, how we're going to deal with the physical limitations on this campus, and then uh, get ready for what's next. Um, so you can read uh, faster than I can talk. Um, so the most notable thing about this slide is we have some new names. So um, we are now data science to patient value, um, uh, HI3, uh, catchy acronym, uh, CFRET. Um, uh, and I would say of the uh, five announcements we made last year, the, the general theme is they have started faculty recruitment. They've organized seminar series. Um, some of them have issued some pilot grants. Um, and we have faculty candidates uh, coming through the campus who I think um, are going to make important contributions over the um, uh, upcoming years. Uh, the last item on this slide, the, uh, the what was formerly, the artist formerly known as BIPM, now known as the Colorado Center for Personalized Medicine, has been in existence longer and therefore uh, I think has made good progress in both faculty recruitment They've started patient recruitment, so they've now consented 12,000 patients to participate in the uh, biobank and um, electronic health record uh, registry. And the trajectory, the rate of those consents is um, uh, increasing. Um, and they are in the final stages of getting a CLIA certification for their sequencing lab so that that uh, sequencing data can be uh, used uh, for clinical decision making um, in taking care of patients. And the first foray for that will probably be in uh, pharmacogenomics. Um, so it's uh, an exciting time. Um, they've really only had about nine months or so to get going since uh, we started dispersing the money. So uh, I anticipate um, next year at this time we'll have uh, a lot more progress to report. Um, but uh, I think so far things are looking um, very positive. So we have a lot of new talent, and I'm not going to read all the names, but I'm, I am going to mention the institutions to let you know where people are coming from and then comment on uh, one of the phenomena that will become obvious uh, as you look at some of the last names, but not all the last names. So we have entered the era where we're, we're recruiting couples. Um, so uh, Liz Pomfrey and Jim Pompicelli uh, came from the Leahy Clinic um, outside of Boston. Um, they are uh, married. Uh, Gretchen Arendt and Steve Arendt are coming from the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, Gretchen will lead the breast cancer program here. Um, as you might guess by their names, they are married. Uh, Oliver Eichelberg and on the next uh, page, uh, Melly Konigshoff are a couple that joined us from uh, Munich, Germany. Um, uh, Shanta Zimmer and Fernando Hogan, who joined us from the University of Pittsburgh, um, are um, a couple. Ann Fulbrigger, our new Senior Associate Dean for Clinical Affairs. 
and Rob Fulbrighi, about two thirds of the way down this slide, um, are also a couple and joined us from Harvard. Uh, Valeria Canto Solar came from Hopkins. Vesna and Slobodan Todorovic, also a couple, uh, joined us from the University of Virginia. Uh, Mike Verneris came from Minnesota. Uh, Francisco Sturius came from Scripps in California. Uh, Lori Sussel came from Columbia. So we are attracting uh, great talent from uh, first class institutions. And that, as I said, is just a sampling of um, the faculty growth, which numbers 300 over uh, the last year. And this is our most important asset. Um, it, the buildings are great, the hospital facilities are great, but it's the uh, faculty and staff uh, who work here that differentiate us from um, uh, everybody else. So um, our challenge, our goal, um, and our privilege is to recruit um, outstanding faculty to join us here and to uh, so-called grow our own, um, develop our uh, students and trainees into the faculty of the future. So in the last few minutes here, I want to talk about a couple of the challenges on, on the horizon. Uh, one is um, we have largely been in a culture where we tell everybody we're really good. Uh, now we actually have to prove that we're really good. Um, so we have to demonstrate um, our value because the marketplace is changing. Um, we have a space problem um, that we'll uh, talk about. Um, they say you can't over communicate, so I'm going to communicate again about space. Um, uh, we have some issues on the future of care delivery um, uh, that we'll talk about um, and the future of science funding. And knock on wood, if we uh, get through our reaccreditation, uh, it's time to take a significant look at overhauling our uh, medical curriculum. So all big, um, big challenges, but um, good challenges. So, uh, we are entering the uh, era where everything's on the internet. Um, so there's CMS Hospital Compare, there's CMS Doctor Compare, um, there's Health Grades, there's Yelp. Um, there are a variety of things that provide ratings. Um, and so we are going to have to and uh, have started uh, putting out our data publicly. So we have made a pilot into posting. Uh, publicly posting patient satisfaction results on in primary care and in urology. Um, I think uh, probably University of Utah was the pioneer on this and putting all their doctors' patient satisfaction data up on the web uh, for uh, patients to see. Um, uh, clinical outcomes are going to be publicized, and we should welcome this. Um, our bone marrow transplant uh, data um, uh, shows clearly that we are the best bone marrow transplant program in the state of Colorado and in this region. Um, and anybody who looked at that data would come here to get their bone marrow transplant. Uh, similarly, for a variety of advanced stage common cancers, we have statistically significantly better um, outcomes than um, uh, Colorado as a whole and the nation as a whole. Um, if you look at transplant outcomes, we have um, a good track record. If you look at the pediatric ICU outcome data at children's or the pediatric cardiac surgery uh, data at children's, um, we have great results. Um, and we uh, have to uh, make that known so that when people make their choices, they come uh, to the right place. Um, and uh, the world of um, people looking at things is um, uh, changing. Um, Independent of Obamacare and the Affordable Care Act, um, the commercial marketplace is changing, and the move is to make patients assume more of the um, responsibility for their uh, health care costs. Um, uh, one of the ways of doing that is the high deductible plan. Um, so I, I want you to know I paid the royalty for this cartoon so I can show it uh, uh, publicly. Um, but as the economists have been predicting for years, when people have to write the check, they behave differently than when it doesn't cost them any money. Um, so now uh, more and more um, people are having discussions like, doctor, do I really need that MRI? Or um, uh, you know, can I wait six months instead of coming back in four months? Um, uh, because um, the first big chunk of that money is coming out of their own pocket. So now let's talk about space. 
Uh, the only person more excited about space in this room than me is Peter Buttrick. Um, uh, so uh, we're making progress at uh, reallocating our current research space, but we need to do more. Um, our, uh, our grant funding is up, and I, if memory serves, Peter told me the other day, on average, we're at about $335 per square foot um, uh, on this uh, campus. Um, but um, I think everybody who's in those buildings acknowledges that we are not at 100% efficient utilization. Um, and um, before uh, we get the chancellor to open his checkbook, um, uh, we need uh, to do the responsible thing and um, uh, utilize our space efficiently because the lead time for creating new space is measured in years, not in days. And um, we don't want to wait that long to recruit um, the kind of talent we're going after uh, to this campus. Um, so I was going to say, uh, I tried to be gentle on here and say we need to do more. Um, you could cross out the need and put in will. Uh, we will do more um, uh, over the upcoming year. Um, uh, those of you who see patients or those of you who oversee uh, faculty who see patients uh, know all too well that uh, we are out of office space for uh, clinicians um, and need to address uh, that need. Um, so as you heard in the chancellor's um, uh, state of the campus uh, speech, um, we're uh, talking about putting up a new building, um, now casually named RC3. Um, but if you have you know, $200 million burning a hole in your pocket and you would like to see your name in lights, um, we can uh, help you out. Um, and the discussions now are what the programming for that building should look like. Um, in terms of our research enterprise, uh, looking ahead, the most immediately limiting resource we have is the vivarium, um, particularly procedure rooms and exposure uh, facilities. Um, but it won't be long before other things uh, catch up. So. Um, uh, we're making good progress at having conversation with a number of constituents around the campus as to what should go in this building. And we only have this uh, small minor issue of um, how to pay for it um, uh, to deal with. And that's why I'm confident that we um, can replace our current bonds with uh, a new load of debt that we can be paying off over the next 20 years. All right, so what's ahead? So this is my favorite management tool, the lucky eight ball here. Um, change is certain, and uh, you probably will recognize this person. Um, uh, as of uh, 48 hours from now, less, um, 44 hours from now, uh, this is, uh, he will be the President of the United States, and as you've been reading in the papers, uh, the shared mission between the presidency and our um, congressional uh, leaders is the repeal of Obamacare. So I have my second cartoon of the talk here. Um, uh, uh, refilling, uh, referring to the reveal and replace. Um, uh, so I think this is a source of real concern for us and should be for all of America. Um, uh, if there's an interval between the repeal and the replace, there's going to be uh, chaos. Um, and I think the latest estimates I saw in the press this morning um, out of the Congressional Budget Office, if they repeal and don't replace right away, uh, 18 million people who are currently covered by health insurance will be uncovered, um, um, which is uh, a huge disruption and a huge disservice to um, the American population, in my opinion, speaking as a private citizen and not as a state official. Um, uh, so what's ahead? Um, so I showed this slide last year. Um, there are a variety of uh, names that this uh, goes under, um, volume to value, population health. Um, when are we going to move from a fee-for-service environment, which we are in now in Colorado, uh, the overwhelming amount of our portfolio is in fee-for-service, and we have done well in fee-for-service. Um, you saw the numbers earlier. Uh, some of that relates to increased volume of patients we see, and some of it uh, uh, relates to the very good work that our contracting office has done in our practice plan in getting us uh, better rates uh, over um, time. Um, uh, 
so the question is, are we going to move um, uh, from uh, volume to value? Are we going to be in risk contracts where, where um, a portion uh, of our reimbursement depends on the quality of care we uh, deliver? Will we ever move all the way to, uh, towards a totally uh, capitated system? Uh, there is a spectrum of opinion about this. Um, the proponents, uh, some of whom were in CMMI and um, pledged to get 50% of the Medicare payment portfolio into alternative payment medicine, uh, methods by next year, um, are proponents of this. If you look at people who do this for a living, like the Hospital Corporation of America, um, they're betting it's going to be a long time before this transition um, uh, takes place. Um, so that's one of the... Um, decisions we have to make um, uh, and participation in these two clinically integrated networks are one of the ways we're trying to get ready uh, for this uh, transition. So what don't we know about the future? What's going to happen with Medicaid? What's going to happen with Medicare? Are we going to go to vouchers or um, the euphemistically termed premium support? Um, so our seniors can go buy health care in a marketplace that doesn't exist because it hasn't existed because we have Medicare. Um, what's going to happen with the NIH? Uh, the 21st Century Cures Act put an additional $2 billion into the NIH over the next eight years or so. But um, what's going to happen to the baseline budget of the National Institutes of Health? Who's, who's the director going to be? Um, uh, uh, Popular thinking is that PCORI is going to go away when the funding runs out in 2019. Uh, HRQ, who knows, CMMI, Tom Price, the next secretary, potential secretary of HHS, is supposedly not a fan of CMMI, so that could go away. What's going to happen with the exchanges and the private marketplace? So um, we don't have the answers to those things. Um, uh, we're just going to have to wait and see. So we can worry a lot about them. Um, you know, if uh, Congress votes in block grants for Medicaid, um, uh, and um, that's going to change the landscape dramatically uh, here in Colorado and all states. Um, if uh, Medicare, as we know, it gets converted to a different system, that'll have a profound impact, et cetera. So what do we know? Um, one is sort of the societal thing. We're approaching 20% of GDP, um, and um, we can't continue on this trajectory as a society and be uh, financially viable and internationally uh, competitive. Um, so costs have to be reined in somehow. Um, uh, we're seeing this already. There's a more and more care is being pushed to the outpatient um, setting. Um, more and more people coming through the emergency room who we admit to the hospital are actually admitted to observation and not to uh, inpatient um, status. Um, and that trend, I think, will um, continue. Uh, the population in Colorado is growing, and um, people still need health care. Um, so that is not going away. Um, and we're doing quite well. Um, in the current system, and I'm confident as uh, things change, we will um, uh, adapt appropriately. Um, we still have opportunities for substantial clinical growth. So children, if you look at inpatient market share, uh, children's has uh, got 65% of the inpatient pediatric market um, in Colorado. So a huge chunk, but they would tell you that they think they can grow more. Uh, in the greater Denver metro area, 2.6 million people, the biggest concentration of people in the state of Colorado, uh, we have 10.9% market share um, among adults uh, for the University of Colorado Health System. So um, lots of opportunity to grow. Now, you may be scratching your head and saying, if we actually did grow, where would we put the patients? Because we're full now. Um, and that um, uh, leads to discussions about what the expansion strategy uh, should be and explains some of the new facilities you see going up around Denver. Um, and I think to serve more of the community, uh, we're going to have to start um, practicing off this campus um, and do that in a way that we convince our physicians who are practicing off this campus that we're not exiling them and that they're still an integral part of our um, school uh, community and the uh, and the campus community here 
Um, so that's going to be a challenge for all of us to uh, create that culture that makes people feel part of uh, everything that's going on here, even if they're not physically walking around this campus every day. Um, sorry about the formatting here. Uh, we need to continue to go after the top talent. Um, one of the great things, um, the silver lining of being in challenging times, is when you're doing well and other people are struggling, talented people look around for other opportunities. And um, we should be shamelessly opportunistic about um, uh, recruiting uh, top talent from uh, other places. The other thing we know is our mission has not changed and will not change. Um, we are uh, committed to providing outstanding clinical care uh, to everybody who comes here. Um, we're con uh, committed to trying to do the best possible research that will advance that care so that the med students we train now, 20 years from now, will be able to take better care of patients than we do. Um, we're committed to educating that next generation of healthcare professionals um, and to serving um, our uh, community. Um, so that's the bedrock on which we're built. Um, we're not going to deviate from our um, strategy of embracing diversity in all aspects as um, uh, an essential component of how we're going to meet uh, this mission. So that's diversity in gender, in ethnic background, in religion, in political beliefs, um, in um, uh, socioeconomic status, uh, every parameter you can think of. It's very clear that um, the uh, more inclusive we are, the stronger we become in uh, all of our missions, and we're not going to deviate from that. Um, uh, I've heard a lot of concern from students in particular um, had an interesting, quote, existential crisis, unquote, question from a student at a town hall a few weeks ago um, about their concern about um, the current environment. Um, there is a perception out there, which I think is, is based on anecdote but reflects reality, that um, uh, one of the results of the presidential campaign um, was a uh, divisiveness in the rhetoric and a liberation of some people uh, to more uh, publicly express views that uh, some of us find um, unacceptable. Um, and so students report um, uh, more, um, more such remarks from patients. Um, and uh, all I can say is that uh, on this campus, um, we are going to uh, continue to support free speech. Um, uh, but uh, speech delivered in a respectful uh, manner um, and uh, embrace a diversity of ideas um, uh, going forward. Um, uh, some people are very upset that Donald Trump is the next president. Some people are very excited that Donald Trump is the uh, next president. And we have uh, components of both uh, in this room and certainly in this university. Um, and the fact of the matter is Donald Trump is the next president. Um, uh, but... Um, it does not mean that um, we're going to have an environment that um, degenerates into some of the rhetoric we saw uh, during the last uh, campaign. Um, and we're going to continue to grow. Um, I think we are cognizant of the fact that it's unrealistic to expect the next decade is going to have 10 percent year over year growth, um, that the growth in our clinical contracts is going to level off. At some point, our clinical volume trajectory will change. Um, and so we're not going to make commitments uh, based on unrealistic economic projections, but neither are we going to sit still. Um, uh, we cannot grow the research enterprise here if we don't grow the clinical enterprise. Um, and um, so those two go hand in hand. And the LCME will be here March 5th through 8th. <laughs> Dr. Anderson will be briefing all of you. Um, if you have suggestions to make the school a better place, I would welcome that you share them with me or any of the team in the dean's office. I would hope that you would share them with us before you decide you want to share them with the LCME. Um, and let me just say that. So I'm going to close by saying um, what I say to all the medical students. Um, you know, we can get wrapped around the axle here and talk about 
the sky is falling in Medicaid, the sky is falling in Medicare, and you know, the electronic health record is a pain, et cetera, et cetera. But the fact of the matter is, this is an ex a tremendously exciting time in science and medicine. And um, I'm a little envious of students who are going into medicine now. Um, they have uh, things at their disposal and a, an understanding of science that, that didn't exist uh, when I went to medical school back in the dark ages. Um, and the notion that you know HIV is a treatable disease, hepatitis C is a curable disease. Um, uh, I've got two little grandchildren running around that if they were born when um, I was young would not be here today, um, all because of um, uh, advances in medicine and science. So um, it's a great time to uh, be going into science and medicine. It's a great time to be in the field. And it's a privilege. Um, uh, we are treated well um, in our society. And if you're going to be in medicine and science, this is a great place to be in medicine and science. Um, uh, there is nobody who comes to this place who doesn't remark on what a spectacular environment we have. Um, nobody who doesn't remark on the energy we have. I had breakfast this morning with uh, an old colleague from Pittsburgh, Mark Gladwin, who's here as a visiting professor. and. Um, I think he's a little bit envious. Um, and the childish part of me is uh, takes pride in that. Um, so um, uh, I will close on that note. I thank you for uh, all of your attention, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that anyone has. As I said... There is uh, sugar and uh, data on the uh, front tables here uh, for any of those who would like it. Seeing no questions, I think we'll have cookies. Thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs>